All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started with our, our next presentation. Just uh, a couple of quick announcements. For those of you who are attending and uh, looking to get your CLE credit, uh, at the end of the day or whenever you're ready to leave, uh, they will be back at the registration table. That's where you drop off your CLE um, forms, and we'll take care of processing all of those uh, through for you. Um, also, just a, a quick announcement. On Thursday, February 17th, uh, from 4.30 to 5.30 in this room, uh, George Callard will be here to um, make a CLE presentation for one hour credit. Um, it's called From the Couch to the Web, Developments in Multi-Channel Video Programming, Distrib Distribution Industry, and Current Legal Issues. Um, that will be next Thursday from 4.30 to 5.30. There also are a lot of symposiums and seminars that are going on here at the, at the law school. All of those pamphlets and brochures will be out on the round table in the rotunda on your way out. Um, so for our next panel, um, we have what we think is a first uh, here at Case Western Reserve's Law School. We have our first father-daughter panel. Um, the first panelist is Dr. Peter French. Um, Dr. French is on the faculty at, the at Arizona State University. He's the Lincoln Chair in Ethics, Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Lincoln Center for Applied Ethics. Um, he's written numerous books. Um, his last book is the one that I have read, um, parts of it. It's called War, War and Moral Dissonance, and it's actually the foundation uh, for their presentation this afternoon. Um, Doctors French and French um, worked together providing ethics training to U.S. military chaplains, uh, both post-deployment and pre-deployment um, with the chaplain services in the U.S. military. And so uh, Dr. Peter French is the father. Uh, he's bringing his experience, um, been looking at these conflict issues and issues of moral dissonance between professional and ethical obligations and, and some other issues regarding necessity for many, many years. Uh, his daughter is Shannon French, also a Ph.D., um, she is here at Case Western Reserve University. She is the director of the Inamori Institutional Center for Ethics and uh, Excellence. Um, she will be joining us live today. Dr. French, being at Arizona State University, had other commitments which also happen to coincide with the fact that the weather in Arizona in February is much nicer than the weather in Cleveland uh, in February. Um, so he was not able to attend uh, um, with us today for a number of logistical reasons, uh, but he did, in fact, provide his presentation ver uh, via DVD. So we will play his presentation for you, and then Shannon French will be here uh, as the live panel to discuss their work with the military chaplain services, their experiences, and what the chaplains were going through, and then to answer and take questions. All right, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Peter French. I want to thank the organizers of this symposium for allowing me to make my presentation in this video format. Other commitments make it impossible for me to attend in person. I am by profession and for 47 years a philosopher. However, what I'm going to relate has very little philosophy in it. It's a piece of a memoir of two years during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. My philosophical analyses that were triggered by events I will be recounting are found in my book, War and moral dissonance. What I hope to do, in keeping with the theme of this conference, is to portray, as I saw it, the struggles of a certain group of military persons, those in the Navy Chaplain Corps, with loyalty so clearly divided that they wear them on opposite collars of their uniforms. The Navy Chaplain Corps provides chaplains for the Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard. Its members served on ships in the Persian Gulf and in country in both Iraq and Afghanistan. In the fall of 2003, I became a member of a small team of professors and retired Navy officers hired by a company that won a contract to teach ethics to the chaplains in week-long professional development training courses, or PDTCs. We were to acquaint the chaplains with moral theories, virtue concepts, and character development issues and help them deal with moral conflicts and the ethical education of their units during deployments. There probably were a number of reasons for the Corps to schedule such training of its members. 
One might have been that among the alarming revelations in a Pentagon report on the ethics of the troops was the statistic that only 38% of Marines believe that non-combatants are to be treated with dignity and respect. Also in 2006, a senior chaplain told me that the Pentagon had been raising questions about why chaplains typically were shirking one of their primary duties, that is, providing moral advice to command. Also, in the summer of 2003, the Associated Press reported that the Navy had punished over 40 chaplains in the previous decade for offenses ranging from sexual abuse and adultery to fraud, a misconduct rate higher than other officers. We taught the four-day PDTCs in two-person teams on Navy and Marine bases at locations around the world, from Okinawa to Naples, Italy, from Hawaii to Virginia, from Camp Pendleton to Camp Lejeune. The sessions each day covered a spectrum of topics from the traditional ethical theories to moral motivation, divine command theory, conflicts of duty, just war theory, the ethics of care, truth-telling, moral numbing, and a host of others. Between sessions, the chaplains were given 10 to 15 minute breaks. Some of the chaplains would use those breaks to approach me and the other Schnee, uh, that's subject matter expert in Navy speak, with questions that frequently involved relating incidents they had experienced during deployments. In early 2004, the stories usually concerned whether a report on an incident should have been sent up the chain of command or whether a counseling session with a chaplain was sufficient to handle it. Later, the stories became more and more horrific, and the chaplains often expressed deeply felt anxiety about the individual and collective moral standing. The OSTM, that's the on-site training manager, a captain, at my first assignment in January 2004 at the Anti-Submarine Warfare Training Center at Point Loma, informed me that the Pentagon has a committee, it's called the Armed Forces Chaplains Board, that determines which religions are, re are legitimate and rate having chaplains in the military. Incur inclusion of a religion seems uh, to lean heavily on judicial and IRS decisions. There are more than 100 recognized religions, not all with chaplains. The majority of chaplains represent the Christian denominations, there are a few Jewish chaplains, one of whom was an admiral, and I met one Muslim. A would-be chaplain must have a baccalaureate degree of not less than 120 semester hours uh, from a college or university listed in the directory of post-secondary institutions and have completed three years of resident graduate study in theology. The aspiring chaplain also must be ordained by and have the endorsement of one of the recognized faith groups. The OSTM explained that they get uh, clergy in the core that are not your typical parish priests and ministers. Their faith groups, he said, generally are more than willing to endorse them for the core. Meeting the entry criteria, the would-be chaplain undergoes 10 weeks of basic training at Newport, Rhode Island. The first six weeks are to get the recruits in physical shape and the other four acquaint them with the sea services and protocol and offer ministerial training with specific relevancy to the sorts of duties they will be undertaking. Upon completion of the training course, they, gra they graduate as lieutenants junior grade and can rise in the ranks to admiral. Each morning's PDTC began with a non-sectarian prayer. The Navy requires that all prayers offered by the chaplains at public functions be non-sectarian. I pulled the OSTM aside during a break and I asked, to whom was the chaplain praying this morning? For a moment he stared blankly and then he responded, God. Some general God or the God of his religion, I asked. You don't think a prayer can be non-sectarian, he wondered? It occurred to me, I said. He acknowledged that he didn't really approve of the policy, but it was Navy regulations. He said that some chaplains had complained about it, that it was always good to offer thanks to and ask for guidance from God. So, I ventured, you all believe in the same God? He smiled. He was anxious to refill the coffee urn. 
But I asked, you're a Lutheran. When you give the prayer, are you praying to the Christian God even though you don't mention that? He admitted that was what he thought he did. And so I said, so your prayer isn't really non-sectarian. He hesitantly nodded. Uh, it's one of the problems with the pluralistic environment of the chaplain corps, he responded. Our code of ethics requires that we work collegially with chaplains of religious bodies other than our own and respect the beliefs and traditions of our colleagues. I had read their code of ethics and I wondered how the line in it that says the chaplains serve God and country is to be understood. He smiled pluralistically, I guess. A number of chaplains were, like the OSTM, intellectually and spiritually aware of the thin line they walked between being the pastoral representations of their faith groups and being commissioned officers in the Navy. On the right collar of the chaplain's uniform is the insignia of military rank. On the left collar is the insignia of the chaplain's faith, a cross, a tablet, a crescent, so on. At many PDTCs, a chaplain would point to his two collars during the discussion of an ethical issue related to some military situation that had struck very near to home. That gesture expect, expressed the schizophrenic-like nature of their jobs. Sometimes it would be referred to just by the words, two collars. During a session uh, at Pearl Harbor, one of the chaplains expressed it as I preach love and forgiveness and mercy and respect for other people while I work for an organization that sees itself as having only two jobs, to kill people and destroy property. How do you like that, Dr. French? <laughs> During the years of the PDTCs, there was an internal legal conflict in the chaplain corps between those from fundamentalist evangelical Christian churches and those representing the liturgical Protestant and Catholic churches. During the session on Kantianism at the Little Creek Amphibious Base in late March 2004, I was asked by an older chaplain to explain how the history of promotions in the Corps could be ethical. At a break, he told me that he and other evangelical chaplains serving and retired were party to a class action suit to move more of their number up the ranks. One of his buddies spewed out that they had to work in an environment polluted with bias against their faith groups. They pass over us for promotion and give us bad ratings only because of the denominations we represent, he said. The Catholics and the Lutherans make up the selection board. They'll promote a Jew or a Muslim before one of us. When I got a chance, I Googled the lawsuit. In addition to claiming discriminatory promotional practices that favor the liturgical Protestants and Catholics, it also, it also alleges that evangelical Protestant chaplains have had their sermons censored and that they have had to officiate at liturgical services while the liturgical chaplains have not had to conduct non-liturgical non services. On more than one occasion, I overheard the chief of chaplains referred to as that papist. And snide remarks were made about the admiral, who was Jewish. Those sorts of expressions virtually disappeared in 2006, replaced with much more pressing concerns about the mental health and well-being of the chaplains, and a general apprehension that those in command were not focused on the need to care for those caregivers being emotionally devastated during and after deployments in Iraq. As a side note, in 2007, a U.S. District Court in Washington rejected one of the challenges of the uh, chaplain selection criteria uh, in the suit. That decision was affirmed in 2008 by the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. In January 2004, the first wave of success the U.S. troops experienced following the invasion of Iraq was over. The slog of occupation was setting in. At Point Loma, I was teamed with my daughter, Professor Shannon French, then a professor at the Naval Academy, who not only had years of experience in teaching much of the material, but had a good grasp of the jargon of the sea services, something I lacked. In one session, my topic was truth-telling. 
One of the PowerPoint slides we used contained a story premised on the fact that the Commodore and his staff were conducting a command inspection of a ship. A divo, or that's division officer, was responsible for equipment maintenance. On the Friday before the Monday inspection, his CPO, Chief Petty Officer, told the divo that he had overscheduled maintenance for the week, so he marked off four jobs that were not actually completed in order to look all clear for the inspection. He promised the divo the jobs would be completed the next week. The next slide asked questions of the chaplains as if they were the divo. Pretty much in unison, they pointed out that the questions are not relevant to their assignments as chaplains. I refocused the questions by asking them what they should do uh, or say to the divo when he asks their advice. One of them said, I tell him to resign. Two or three said, gun decking happens all the time. I was told that too many ships sail out of harbor with incomplete maintenance on equipment, putting crews and missions at risk. They agree that if the chaplain knows about gun decking, he must take action. But action for most of the chaplains means send it up the chain. It is then somebody else's problem. I pointed out that they are required to follow it up the chain and see that action is taken. It's not enough to just report it. They may need to nag. Many of them seemed shocked that two chaplains were court-martialed because they had not followed through on reports about the My Lai massacre during the Vietnam War. In neither of those cases, however, were the trials held. At Pearl Harbor, I asked how many of them had been aware of cover-ups of maintenance on ships on which they had been stationed. More than half raised their hands. Others volunteered that it's also a regular occurrence in country with the Marines. Only three volunteered that they'd reported their knowledge to the appropriate superiors. One said that uh, he was told it was none of his business. Later I learned from a lieutenant commander that gun decking comes from the fact that the deck just below the top deck on British warships was called the gun deck, even though there were no guns on it. I heard an astounding variety of examples of how widespread gun decking is, revealing that chaplains know a great deal about the daily shady activities of those in their units at all the ranks. But they do little with the, that knowledge, and even sometimes abet the activities, believing themselves impotent to make any significant difference. They may be officers, but after all, they're chaplains. The truth-telling session concluded with discussions on when lying might be morally justified. Most of the chaplains expressed discomfort with ever permitting lying on consequentialist grounds, even though they knew it frequently occurred with respect to military operations. One said that if he only had the pin on the left collar to worry about, he'd probably condemn all lying. But then there was that insignia of rank on the other collar. During a discussion of divine command ethics at Point Loma, I called on one of the most intellectually astute chaplains in the room. He asked if I had a problem, as he did, with the book of Job. His question provoked me to a less than respectful recitation of the story of Job that I will not inflict on you here. Suffice it to say that I concluded by describing poor, misused, and, mal and maligned Job, full of open sores, emotionally distraught, sitting on a heap of dung and ashes, and God appearing to him in a whirlwind. I suggested that sounded like torture to me. The OSTM met with my daughter and me after the chaplains left the room that day. He told me that he could not find anything about Job in the validated PowerPoint slides. Some deviation was probably okay, but we needed to be careful because the chaplains got upset when material was covered that was not in the workbooks they'd been given. I took that as a kind of gentle rebuke. The next day, one of the chaplains cornered me during a break, and he wanted to explain to me that God had, after all, restored Job to everything that was taken from him. I asked him if he thought that made what was done to Job morally permissible. Ethically, can you torture an innocent person, and after you've finished, pay him off for what you did to him? The chaplain said that 
would not be ethical. Is it okay if God does it, I asked? He shook his head. Not as a way of saying no, but as a way of expressing his decision not to pursue this any further. Justification of torture, however, was still to become a topic for the chaplains, though not one in their workbooks. One of the chaplains who had recently returned from a deployment in Iraq in a private conversation with me asked if I had been saved. I told him that I had no intention of joining any organized faith group, and he told me that the rule in the Corps is that a chaplain cannot attempt to convert a sailor or a marine who is already affiliated with another faith group, but that the unaffiliated are fair game. I asked if he had much success in the conversion business in Iraq. He said, no, it's getting ugly. He continued, if this goes on much longer, I fear one way or the other, we're all going to hell. That was in January 2004. At Little Creek, two months later, many of the chaplains had seen war up close in either Iraq or Afghanistan, and they were beginning to exhibit mental and spiritual fatigue. During the PDTC, the news was about Fallujah. Blackwater mercenaries had been dragged through the streets, hung, and burned. The military's natural reaction was to get revenge, and the result was the ill-fated Operation Vigilant Resolve with a significant number of US casualties. Some of the chaplains expressed their frustration with the Iraqi people who didn't appreciate what we were doing for them. A few said that we ought to blow up the whole country and get the oil. During a discussion of just war theory, a chaplain asked if this stuff was being taught to the midshipmen at the Naval Academy. I said that it was. He forced a laugh, and I asked why. Because there's no point in it, is there? It will have no impact on us or the midshipmen when they become officers. What does it matter if a war is just or unjust? We have nothing to do with the decision to fight. We fight it wherever they tell us to because we're ordered to. Filling officers' heads with this crap about when a war is unjust can only weaken their resolve to do their duty. How can they be good officers if they're worried that they might be fighting an unjust war? I responded that Chaplin should know what is being taught at the academy about what makes a war just or unjust, because one of the officers in a unit in which they're deployed might come up and tell you that he or she is convinced that this one is unjust. What do you say to that young officer then, I asked. You tell the coward to resign his commission, came the response. I then suggested that knowing about just war theory might help in dealing with the relatives of Marines killed in the war if you could assure them that they died in a just war. Forced laughter. The same chaplain explained that when he had met with a spouse or a parent of a Marine that was killed in the Iraq war, he assured them that their Marines had died in the line of duty protecting America. Protecting them from what, I asked? From mushroom clouds over their town, from WMDs. But I reported, there are no WMDs. How do you know, came the reply. Followed by, the commander in chief says there are. He's the boss. God bless him. I tell them that they should be proud that their relative died in the service of President Bush. Are they usually consoled, I asked? Yeah, usually, but I never get into this just war stuff. If we're sent to Iraq or Afghanistan, that's all we need to know. He got up and he promptly left the room, ostensibly to make a needed trip to the bathroom. A few other chaplains volunteered as to how difficult it is to make those dreaded calls at the homes of the relatives of dead Marines. It's a relief when no one asks if the relative died for a good cause. You pray that all you have to say is that they died doing their duty. After the session, some expressed worry that there was probably something important that the United States government was pursuing in Iraq, but it wasn't WMDs. There was a flicker in their expression of doubt about the mission from the minority of chaplains at Little Creek. That flicker became a bonfire in coming years. 
In a session on moral numbing, we used a case in which a chaplain on a ship in the Persian Gulf during the shock and awe period witnessed the sailors who launched the missiles destined for Baghdad leaving a pizza party, carrying out their mission firing duties, and then nonchalantly returning to the pizza. He concluded that their acts were robotic. They were morally numb to what they were doing. The issue was whether it is morally important in an age of virtual warfare that sailors not disassociate themselves from the consequences of their acts of button pushing. I told this story to a businessman with whom I was having lunch. He said that we should want robotic sailors, soldiers, and marines. We don't want them worrying about the moral status of their actions. They should separate what they do in wartime from the rest of their lives. Be robots, if that's what it takes. He said, we're paying them to do the dirty work, but we shouldn't make them confront it at a personal level. I pointed out that if we take that approach, we're using them as we might use a tool to do a job we want done. That was exactly what he thought we should uh, do, exactly what he thought should be the case. He said, after the war, let them get back to being moral citizens of the country without all that ethical baggage. They'll be much happier, he said. None of the chaplains expressed similar views when the session on moral numbing was taught, but as the war continued and the mental condition of the troops and the chaplains deteriorated, I sometimes wondered if the businessmen didn't have a point, albeit one that could corral very little ethical support. The moral and the psychological weight of the war was being borne by those in combat, and the caregivers on which the combatants depended while those who concocted the war, engineered it, manufactured it, marketed it, seemed to bear none of that burden. Nor, as I discovered in the PDTCs in 2006, did they provide adequate care for those on whom the burden fell. Uh, a young chaplain who cornered me during a break at Little Creek had a certain look in his eye that I later learned to identify as the thousand yard stare. Doc, you serve in the war? I told him that during Vietnam I taught on Homestead Air Force Base, but had never been in combat. A fobbit, huh? Never see a friend of yours get his brains blown out? I asked what a fobbit is. He chuckled. A fobbit is what we call somebody who stays behind the wire, never faces fire. Most of the guys, especially contractors stationed in Iraq and Afghanistan, are fobbits. The bases are FOBs, forward operating bases. They stay in the Shire like hobbits, you know, fobbits. I nodded. There was considerable disdain for fobbits among those who venture outside the wire. He went on to tell me that while he was serving with some uh, unit fighting the Taliban in Afghanistan, a Marine whom he had brought to Christ was shot and killed a few yards away from him. It made him so furious that he picked up the fallen Marine's rifle and was about to start firing in the direction of the Taliban unit when his RP, that's a religious program specialist who's trained to protect chaplains in combat areas, stopped him. The RP said, chaps, I got your back. Put the rifle down. You got other things to do here. After a minute or two, he dropped the rifle. Then he said to me, Doc, I really wanted to kill some of them son of bitches. And I would have if that RP hadn't been there. I'm sure of it. He touched his collars, lingering longer on the cross. Then he shook his head. Maybe next time. With the help of his RP, he had won a battle against the personal demons that tempted many of the chaplains in the combat zones. But did he doubt he would have had the moral courage to repeat that success on his next deployment? Did he really want more to be a Marine than a chaplain? There were a number of chaplains who seemed to me to be frustrated would-be Marines. They're in a very difficult bind, and it's not made easier by stories that float in the culture of, of the core about chaplains taking up weapons in desperate situations. 
At Pearl Harbor in May 2004, there was a pall over the PDTC. Pictures from Abu Ghraib prison had been all over the TV and the internet. During a session on just in bello, that is justice in war, I asked the chaplains, how does Abu Ghraib make you feel? Minutes passed, and then a lieutenant commander raised his hand, ashamed. There was nodding around the table. One chaplain volunteered that the Marines he knew had done equally despicable things to Iraqi civilians. A number mentioned the reaction they witnessed in their units when scuttlebutt about what was going on at Abu Ghraib and other detention centers made the rounds. And a few claimed we didn't know the whole story. That was shouted down. The general view of the chaplains gathered at Pearl Harbor was that the soldiers serving as prison guards at Abu Ghraib must have been acting under orders and a chaplain would have been seen as trying to contravene orders had he tried to stop the torturing. One lieutenant noted that any orders that called for such inhumane treatment of prisoners would be immoral and illegal. He had not yet been deployed to Iraq and that seemed to rob him of his credibility with those who had but what he said was correct. I injected into the discussion a theme that we had used from the first PDTC. Are you chaplains not supposed to be Nathan? You are the moral advisors to command. You're supposed to stand before authority and unflinchingly speak the unvarnished truth. Remember Nathan to David? You are the man. I doubted there were many Nathans in that room or at any of the other PDTCs. They were probably more like the chaplain who composed the weather poem on Patton's orders. In fact, in the second series of PDTCs, when I asked how many had been told to offer up prayers by COs, most of their hands in the room were raised. And stories of being asked to pray for the slaughter of the enemy or make the missiles fly true to their targets were recited. When asked if they complied, Generally, the response was that they had produced a prayer, but maybe not including everything the CO wanted. Well, I assume that those were non-sectarian prayers, by the way. Along those lines, in the second year's PDTC, the chaplains heard Mark Twain's war prayer. Some were uncomfortable with Twain's vividly grotesque interpretation of how God might hear what appears to be a preacher's simple prayer for victory over the enemy army. Others said they would no longer be able to pray for victory. They would restrict themselves to praying for the safe return of their units. I developed a session on moral courage for the 2006 PDTC focused on specialist Joseph Darby. Darby had slipped an anonymous note about the torturing at Abu Ghraib under the door of investigators. The chaplains, to my surprise, were reluctant to praise Darby they wouldn't call him courageous. He had not gone properly up the chain of command. That led me to wonder if a chaplain other than the one who actually served at Abu Ghraib would have made any difference. The chaplains were reluctant to interfere even though their literature tells them that they may need to be cognizant that by my presence is sometimes a powerful deterrent for the troops not to engage in unethical behavior. One of them told me in private that those who have not been over there have no idea what it's like to deal with the type of recruits that are now in the services. He said that, especially in the Army, the ranks are filled with every kind of gang member you can imagine. In villages, he said, God help the women, especially the young girls. They think a chaplain's going to make a difference? A Pentagon study, by the way, identified 165 cases of sexual assault among the troops serving in Afghanistan and Iraq in 2008, and that was an increase of 26% from 2007. By 2006, the loss of American lives escalated. During a session on the third day at Oceana, one of my colleagues asked, how many of you keep a log, a diary, of your experiences during deployment? Most of the hands went up. He then asked if they read them. And a chorus of no's and no ways 
echoed around the room. His puzzlement at this was answered with poignant stories. One chaplain dressed in a Marine Desert camouflage uniform recounted that when he came home from a deployment, his wife and mother-in-law asked him to read some of his diary so they could better understand what he'd been through in Iraq. After reading less than a page, he couldn't continue, and he left the room. Another chaplain who'd been deployed in a medical unit said that she knew her journal was filled with horrible stories that would make anyone sick, but there was no way she was ever going to read it or let anyone else read it. Chaplains are not required to keep journals or diaries, but it's recommended, especially in the combat zones, so that in writing down the experiences, they provide a record for the Corps and help expunge the memories from their own minds. It's referred to as lessons learned. Learned, perhaps. Most definitely not forgotten. For many of the chaplains, I suspected that the traumas they were observing and counseling were creeping into their psyches, like the blob from the 1950s horror movie, rolling over them and absorbing them, along with those Marines for whom they were to provide care, solace, and theological escape. Perhaps because I was the oldest member of the team, or because I had no direct affiliation with the Navy or the Pentagon, chaplains would tell me their stories and ask me to concur with what they'd done. They wanted my approval. Often I did not approve, but lied. At a 2006 PDC, at the chapel not far from the Marine Corps Air Station Miramar, one of the chaplains pulled me aside. he just returned from Iraq, and there was tiredness in his voice, as if it were a strain to talk. Doc, he said, I was north of Baghdad with my unit. They'd been fighting for the better part of two days, clearing out a suspected nest of insurgents. It wasn't as bad as some engagements. So I don't think any of the guys got a scratch. This E3, he paused and noticed that I didn't understand the reference. Lance Corporal, he clarified, was shaking with tears running down his face. He told me that he had rescued two young Iraqi kids who'd been walking towards the fire zone and brought them back behind the lines. The gunny told him to get rid of the kids and get back to work. He set off with them, not understanding anything they were saying. Behind a wall, he found what he took to be their father crouching down and hiding. The children went to him, and the Lance Corporal headed back to his unit. The chaplain continued, but after he got only a few yards, he heard shots behind the wall. He rushed back, and he found the two children shot dead in the head. The Iraqi stood over them with a pistol in his hand. He shouted at the Lance Corporal, something in Arabic that sounded like a curse. Then he put the gun to his head and fired. I stared at the chaplain who continued. The E3 said he couldn't get the images of those children out of his mind. He believed he had done something wrong, that he'd condemned them to death. The chaplain continued. I told him it wasn't his fault. He was just following the gunny's orders. I saw him a couple days later. And he looked terrible. He couldn't sleep. I told him that he had to forget it. It's war. Stuff happens. I said I'd read the Bible with him. He said he wanted to be alone, and he wandered off. They found his body a couple days later floating in the river. The chaplain looked me in the eyes for a moment, and then he lowered his head. Doc, I did the right thing. Yeah, I said. I don't know what else you could do. You can't help everybody. Sure, he muttered, and left me standing at the back of the chapel wondering what I was supposed to say. I certainly wasn't going to quote something from Kant to him. On November 19, 2005, the Haditha massacre occurred. At the preliminary hearing for the captain, who was charged with dereliction of duty for failing to investigate the massacre, the general in charge of the Marines in Al Anbar claimed that the targeting of civilian women and children at Haditha was something he learned of only on February 12, 2006, when a Time reporter questioned the Marine uh, report that had occurred. 
A chaplain in the PDTC at Miramar described the Haditha case to me in detail weeks earlier in January 2006. In a shaky voice, he said that he heard from some of those in his unit that their Humvee hit a roadside bomb and that a Lance Corporal was killed that morning. The squad leader, a staff sergeant, fired eight or so rounds point blank into five Iraqi males, a taxi driver and four teenagers, who were standing by a white car with their hands interlocked behind their heads. Or the champ chaplain tried to recall that maybe their hands were bound. The staff sergeant and the lieutenant then led a squad to three houses. They flagged the houses and rained gunfire on them. Eight Iraqi women and children were dead in one house, seven in another, and four in a third. A mother was shot trying to shield her daughter, though the girl was already dead. One of the sergeants went into the house and the chaplain paused, and then he continued in a soft voice. He pissed, he urinated on the corpses. Why, I wondered. He was angry because his lance corporal was the one killed by the roadside bomb. I saw the pictures of them, the ones they took with their cell phone camera. It was murder, wasn't it? All I could think to say was, did you report it? He shook his head. They know about it, believe me. You don't try to cover up something if you don't know it was bad. When the general was interrogated by military investigators, he is reported to have said, it was just, here's something that happened, and it was on to the next thing. It was not so easy for that chaplain to move on to the next thing. Some of the chaplains used biblical references, such as Garden of Gethsemane experiences, to describe the turmoil they were undergoing, both personally and vicariously, when they had to listen to the Marines in their units who had abandoned ethics and basic virtues when dealing with the Iraqi people. The Garden of Gethsemane was also where Judas betrayed Jesus. Did they also feel betrayed? By whom? At Miramar in 2006, I began the session on humanitarian intervention by asking the chaplains if they knew what the mission now is in, in Iraq. One timidly offered, there is no mission in Iraq, we're just there. An animated discussion ensued in which some argued that maybe the mission had become humanitarian, but others insisted that it was always about oil. And the sooner we admit that to ourselves, the easier it will be to get it over with. Later, an admiral told me not to ask that question again. So I asked it at all of the other PDTCs I taught that spring. The answer that there is no mission in Iraq became the default response, until a chaplain pulled me aside during a break in Naples, Italy, to say that the only mission in Iraq is to kill and maim Americans and Iraqis in order to bolster inept administrations in Washington and Baghdad and make money for contractors. We should have been in New Orleans, where we could have done some good, he said. At the end of the Miramar PDTC, my daughter had to endure criticisms from an admiral about what he regarded as her lack of respect for a certain docking operation and the seriousness of lines crossing when a ship is pulling alongside an auxiliary ship to take on fuel and supplies. The irrelevance of this chastisement compared to the, the serious psychological issues that the PDTCs exposed and that drew no comment at all from him remains a mystery. We assumed that he was putting us in our place and showing off how much he, a chaplain, albeit an admiral, knew of delicate maneuvers of ships at sea, and that he was also diverting our attention from the dirty laundry that the chaplains were hanging out for us to see. At the Kitsap Atomic Submarine Base, we encountered a chaplain who disrupted many of the sessions by intoning in a booming homiletic voice the glorious details of episodes he had experienced on his most recent deployment with the Marines in Iraq. He seemed to have embraced the insignia on his right collar. But Shannon and I wondered if his blustering about the blood and guts strewn about hovels was not a defense mechanism shielding a psychologically distraught person who had seen too much 
and had tried to care for too many. Shannon had developed a session on the transition of warriors from battlefield conditions to civilian life and that the role the chaplain should play in that process. As part of that session, she showed a brief clip from the best years of our lives. In the movie, a sailor and two other World War II returnees are in a taxi parked in front of the sailor's house. His parents and fiance come out of the house to greet him. We see that he's lost both his arms in the war. The greeting is painful for the parents, the fiance, and the sailor. The sailor's reluctant to embrace his fiance with the metal hooks that have replaced his hands. And she's awkward trying not to notice. During the showing of that clip at Oceana, some of the chaplains left the room. Another Shmi and I found them in the ante room on their knees, praying in hushed tones. One of the chaplains in the group looked as if he was a thousand miles away from Oceana, as if he were looking at something in another dimension. Had he come home not completely recognizable by his loved ones? Had he seen himself in the sailor, uncertain of his welcome, uncertain of whether his fiance or his wife would shudder and shrink from his metallic embrace? But he had all his limbs. He looked as fit as any of the rest. In Naples, the chaplain saw the best years of our lives clip as a portrayal of rejection, fear, and humiliation. I wasn't at all certain that what they were recounting was up there on the screen. Some of it, I suspected, was being played on the screens in their minds. Another clip we used at Oceana was the story of a Marine sergeant who suffered psychiatric trauma after having killed an Iraqi woman. A chaplain dressed in Marine desert camouflage interrupted saying, stop it, I'll tell you what happened. I was his chaplain. I became concerned that the PDTC was no longer about character development or ethics. It threatened to become mass psychological group therapy and none of us on the team was trained to deal with that. The chaplain recounted that the sergeant was a real gunji who been in for seven or eight years before the invasion of Iraq. His platoon was in their Amtraks outside Ash Shatra on the road to Baghdad. The sergeant became suspicious of an Iraqi woman in a black burqa who was walking on the other side of the road from their vehicles. The Marines shouted at her to stop, but she kept walking. The sergeant decided that either they had to kill the woman or she was going to blow them up. He took two shots at her, the second hit her. Then Marines in the other Amtrak opened up, cutting her in half. The sergeant inspected the corpse and discovered that she was not in possession of a bomb or any weapon. She held a small white flag. The sergeant threw down his weapon and said to his unit, what the fuck did I just do? I killed an innocent person. That evening, the sergeant told the chaplain that he was mentally cooked and hadn't the stomach to fight anymore. The chaplain explained to the sergeant that because the woman had not stopped when she was called upon to do so, shooting her was within the rules of engagement and justifiable. Two days later, the sergeant told the platoon captain that he could no longer fight and he refused to go on another mission. The chaplain reminded the sergeant that refusing to fight was a court-martial offense but that didn't faze him. His platoon ostracized him, and he was called a coward. After a number of meetings with the chaplain and transferred to another platoon, about three months later, the sergeant was sent home. The sergeant started drinking profusely and picking fights. He couldn't control his temper or his drinking, and he couldn't sleep. He returned to Camp Pendleton and was diagnosed with PTSD. He tried to re-enlist to become a Marine recruiter, but his re-enlistment was denied on the grounds that he'd failed to obey orders in combat, was a coward, and refused to return to Iraq to prove that he was fit for combat duty. He was given an honorable discharge. No joy, the chaplain concluded. 
Some of the others in the room muttered, no joy. There was certainly enough no joy to go around in the PDTC rooms that year. For so many involved in the drama of the Iraq war, there would be no cathartic denouement. As a side note, the senior staff of the Chaplain Corps forbade us to use that clip about the sergeant in any of the other PDTCs. At each of the PDTCs, stories provided to the team by the chaplains were incorporated into the syllabus and used to provoke discussion of the ethical roles to be played by the chaplain when deployed in the combat zone. At Capodicino in Naples, Italy, I was discussing the case of a chaplain in Afghanistan assigned to a Marine battalion. The CEO of the battalion had a habit of publicly humiliating those under him. On a particularly difficult hump, one of the Marines collapsed from exhaustion. The chaplain stopped and gave the stricken Marine some water from his canteen. The CO yelled at the chaplain, Chaplain, you get the fuck out of there. You're weakening my Marines. Don't be, don't be showing kindness to my warriors. Well, some of the Marines in the battalion told the chaplain that degrading them was one thing, but demeaning the chaplain was clearly offensive and improper. The chaplains of the PDVC were supposed to tackle the question of whether the chaplain in the story had an obligation to report the treatment he received at the hands of the CO to higher authority. The majority felt that reporting it up the line would do no good because the higher ranking officers would side with the CO of the battalion. Word of such disloyalty by a chaplain would filter around the Marine Corps and negatively affect the chaplain's next assignment. He would likely get a bad fitness report and his promotion chances would be ruined. Also because action would not likely be taken against the CO, if the CO learned of the chaplain's report going over his head, he probably would become more abusive. As it had on many occasions, the two-collar conflict again surfaced. One said, when they don't like what we're doing, they remind us that we're Navy officers. The captain who'd just taken command of Navy Region Europe harangued the chaplains that they must never forget that they are officers and that they have a duty to provide leadership while also carrying out their obligation to serve as the moral compasses of their units to which they are assigned. The chaplain responded more like chastised children than military officers. The room was filled with the sounds of silence. From the Navy's point of view, it seems the white collar outranks the left. At the next break, the captain told me that the chaplains regularly need to be reminded that they are not in the Navy just to hold religious services, listen to confessions, and comfort and console the grieving. He felt that too often chaplains let opportunities to make an ethical difference in command decisions and daily operations slip by. He attributed some of their inaction to protecting their careers, but he said that's a general problem throughout the military. During the discussion of actions of humanitarian intervention, the case of Captain Lemaire and the United Nations forces in Rwanda was especially provocative. In 1994, Lemaire commanded uh, soldiers who were protecting 2,000 Tutsis in the Don Bosco school compound. Armed Hutus gathered outside the compound, threatening to enter and kill all the Tutsis. Lemaire received orders from headquarters to leave the compound and assist in the transportation of Europeans and their pets to the Kilgali airport. The Tutsis begged Lamar to turn their guns on them if he was going to follow those orders, preferring to be shot by the UN than hacked to death by the machete-wielding Hutus. Lamar followed his orders and 2,000 Tutsis were hacked to death. I asked the chaplains, Suppose you were the chaplain assigned to Lemaire's unit, and he asked you what he should do when ordered to leave the Tutsis in the compound to their fate. Many of them said they would tell him that he should follow orders. That provoked others to shout that a chaplain should insist that Lamar and his troops not leave the compound. Let the Europeans wait. One of the chaplains said that he would stay with the Tutsis. And, he, and be hacked to death by the Hutus, someone asked? Yes, responded the chaplain. That's where a chaplain belongs, not supporting a clearly misguided and immoral order. Some maintain that a chaplain should take a stand and urge the troops to do so, shame them into taking ethical action, even if it meant refusing to follow orders. 
That's mutiny, someone called out. Another responded that if you have a good chance of preventing such an evil outcome, you must try. If you're unsuccessful in getting the troops to stand their ground in the compound, then all you can do is join the victims. What good would that do, one of the chaplains asked. Another responded they would put the chaps on the side of the angels. I asked them if they were saying that a chaplain in a case like this should both urge a commander to disobey superior orders and in any case disobey orders himself. Most said that that was what was required. But I reminded them, throughout the week, you've insisted that you must never counsel disobedience of superior orders. One chaplain spoke up, because I should have done it more than once. Another said, none of us would be so noble as to stay in that compound when the troops left. Most of us would be the first on the bus. Right collar takes precedence. Orders are orders. An African-American chaplain brought that discussion to a close. If you aren't standing with those Tutsis when the UN troops pull away from that compound, God help you. Who the hell do you think stands up for humanitarian behavior in the military, if not us? I did something during the Naples 2006 PDTC that had not been done before. During a session on the ethics of care, I pulled out the report on the suicide of Colonel Ted Westhousing. Colonel Westhousing was a philosophy and English literature professor at West Point. His PhD dissertation was on honor. He was a devout Catholic and, a, and had a wife and three children. He volunteered to go to Iraq. On June 5, 2005, he was found dead in his trailer at Camp Dublin, one of 22 suicides in Iraq by American troops that year. While carrying out his duties, Colonel Westhousing was regularly in conflict with contractors over fraudulent expenses and mercenaries killing Iraqi civilians. He was convinced that the values of the military that he prized, especially honor, were replaced in Iraq by the values of unfettered capitalism. His suicide note read in part, I am sullied no more. I didn't volunteer to support corrupt, money-grubbing contractors nor work for commanders only interested in themselves. I came to serve honorably and feel dishonored. I cannot live this way. All my love to my family, my wife, my precious children, I love you and trust you only. Death before being dishonored anymore. Trust is essential. I don't know who to trust anymore. Why serve when you cannot accomplish the mission, when you no longer believe in the cause? When your every effort, every breath, to succeed meets with lies, lack of support, and selfishness. No more. Reevaluate yourself, commanders. You are not what you think you are, and I know it. I then quoted from Army psychologist, Lieutenant Colonel Lisa Breitenbach's report on Colonel Westhousing. She opined that the Colonel had difficulty understanding how monetary values could take priority over moral ones in war. She said that was a major flaw in his character. <laughs> when I finished, one of the chaplains sighed deeply, bobbed his head up and down, and then said without affect, so his character flaw was that he had a moral character. Another followed suit by asking if that was the real lesson of this PDTC. I quickly backtracked by telling them that I wasn't sharing the West Housing story for that reason. My point was to solicit <laughs> similar to those that apparently Okay. Well, that's right. If, if it's not going to work, we have Dr. Shannon French, who um, can come up and I'm pretty sure can finish the story um, and give us some insight. Um, they work together in these experiences on, on two times together. Um, so she's actually going to be able then to present um, 
further explanation of it and then answer uh, some questions. Dr. French. Thank you. As, <clears throat> um, first of all, I apologize for my, did you tell them why I was, a, oh, <laughs> I had a, I was on another panel <laughs> from 1230 to 1.30, so I, I was a little late coming over here, but I, I knew they would start with, uh, with Dad's uh, video and so I could, I could come in with it in progress. I have to say a little surreal. <laughs> I look in there and I'm like, hi, Dad, oh wait, you're not really here. <laughs> my virtual father and then behind us. Um, I, as, as you may know, I taught for 11 years at the U.S. Naval Academy in the Department of Leadership, Ethics, and Law. So um, much of what we've discussed at this, uh, at this conference so far uh, is, is hitting home for me and relating to work that I, do, I had done and continue to do in military ethics, and also um, uh, reminding me of, of some of the uh, outstanding individuals that I've had the, the honor to work with uh, in, in the, both at the Naval Academy and, and since then in the field. And um, what you heard from my, my father's uh, sort of memoir there of our experiences, or of his, his perspective on our experiences, uh, is, is a slice of, of something that um, I also experienced um, both at the PDTCs that he described and also working at the Naval Academy, and that is the, the tremendous uh, sense of divided loyalties that many of the chaplains felt. And I want to draw a sharp point here of, of contrast because um, earlier on, um, George, I think it was, had made the suggestion that the professions, including the chaplains, should never be asked to compromise their particular ethics to serve in the military. And he put them in the, sort of the same basket with lawyers and, and doctors and, and so forth. Uh, I actually think that, that the chaplains do represent a unique case. Uh, and uh, perhaps that's that's trouble of you know everyone thinks the one that they're studying is a unique case, but I, I, I let me make my argument. Um, what I would submit is that their values, their unique ethics, may actually come into conflict in, in a way that would not occur for uh, the other professions that we're describing, because by their faith and the faith group to which they are. Um, uh, committed and responsible to, uh, that, that commitment is actually to something that they see as higher than the law, higher than the Constitution. So when, uh, when you speak of a chaplain feeling a divided loyalty, it is not, for example, a loyalty to um, doing what they may be pressured to do by the commander and doing what the law requires or doing what the commander in the first place ought to be doing. But they may feel a conflict uh, between what the law says, what the Constitution says, and what they feel should be the case. And I'll give a, a, an example of that uh, in a moment. It is also important to note that unlike the other professions that were cited, there is a, in some cases an extreme difference uh, in, in the specific values and commitments of chaplains of different faiths. Uh, it, it's not, it seems far too little to say it is not a homogenous group. It is more than not a homogenous group. Uh, they have sharp differences in what their, their core values are. So there is not going to be any agreement. Another suggestion that was, was made uh, was uh, in the, the uh, panel about uh, medicine was that the doctors should have a national standard uh, that uh, is not the state-by-state state licensure, but uh, a, a national licensure. Well, you could not have that for the chaplains because the whole point is uh, they are each answerable to what they call their endorsing organization, which is the particular faith group that uh, endorses the chaplain. So what I'd, I'd like to do is just answer a question that might be in some of your minds. Why do we have chaplains in the military at all? Because I think answering that question might get us to a point uh, and that is that, um, that the basic reason for there to be chaplains is in order for individuals serving in the military to not be denied their right to practice their religion. So the key role, and this has been explained to me by many chaplains, the key role of the chaplain is what they call accommodation. So their key role is to ensure that anyone who is serving in, in the unit that they, they've been placed with is able to practice their faith, whatever that faith may be. So this is another conflict that arises uh, for chaplains that, again, I think is fairly unique. So they are put in a position of helping to accommodate uh, others' faiths that, again, may be in direct conflict 
with their own. So I, the example that was so often raised when we did these PDTCs was um, the point about um, chaplains uh, asked to, for example, provide a space for a service member who was a Wiccan and feeling, and this is a chaplain speaking, feeling that that uh, particular religious tradition was actually, in their view, satanic, uh, and therefore feeling that they were being asked to facilitate something that to them was deeply immoral. So this is an example that they brought up. Uh, I don't know actually how many Wiccan service members we have, but it was interesting that any number of these PDTCs, they would bring up that example. So they either had all experienced this once or they had spread this, this around the, the, the chaplain corps as an example and worried about it. More recently, I had the opportunity just last month to speak to the um, National Conference of Ministry to the Armed Forces, which is the organization that includes chaplains from all faiths serving all branches of the military, so not just Navy and Marine Corps, but all of the, the different uh, branches. And one of the, the core issues that came up at that event, not in my keynote per se, but uh, in some of the Q&A and, and at the event generally, was the repeal of don't ask, don't tell, and the potential conflict that this created for the chaplains. Because for some of them within their faith tradition, uh, this, this was something they could not reconcile. So they were uncomfortable with potential situations that hadn't happened yet, but that they thought might happen, where they would be asked to in some way accommodate uh, something that to them was directly opposed to their religious faith. I'll give one more example, and then I, I should probably open it up because we're so far on time, I can kind of field questions um, both off of what my father described and, and from my own experiences. But another example that I wanted to give is that um, chaplains who are asked to be part of the, uh, the arbitration process for conscientious objectors are placed in a very difficult position. Uh, with the Iraq War, for example, uh, there was a statement by Catholic bishops that came out against the justice of that conflict. So we had chaplains who spoke to us about having uh, members within their units come to speak to them saying, well, chaplain, how am I to make sense of this? My faith group has said this is an unjust war. Should I become a conscientious objector? Uh, in, in light of this. Now, the military does not permit selective conscientious objection. You can't say, uh, I will fight in some wars, but not this one, because this one I think is unjust. It, it has to be all or nothing. So the only kind of conscientious objection that's actually permitted uh, legally is where um, you, you say you've had, for example, a conversion of some kind to a faith that does not permit you to fight in any wars, and therefore you have to step out of, of, of service. So the chaplains were, were having to explain this, that no, you cannot become a conscientious objector because your particular faith group has condemned this particular war. But uh, for the chaplains, this again created more than even just the two collar problem, a, a deep, serious uh, personal conflict within them. Should I advise this person to somehow get out of the military? Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, I had one chaplain give me a case where um, the young man who was speaking to him said, should I pretend to be gay, to connect the two issues, uh, in order to get thrown out so that I do not have to fight in a war that my faith group has said is an unjust war? So these are the kinds of conflicts which, to me, they do step beyond some of the ones we were describing before, where it's not a question of making sure that the commander is following the law or making sure that, that, um, that the uh, constitutional values are being upheld by the, the commander, although you did hear some cases of that potentially being raised, but more that the actual values of the chaplain and their faith group <clears throat> may cause for them a conflict that is directly opposed to perhaps the laws of the republic, in some cases, uh, and certainly to uh, the laws within the military as apply. So, you know, this, this is a, a difficulty, and the only thing I will add is, earlier we heard references, uh, Beth made the point about mission creep. Well, the mission creep with the chaplains, which may also make some folks uh, uncomfortable, it certainly made some chaplains uncomfortable, is that having been brought into the military for the purpose I described, to facilitate 
religious practice so that those who serve in the military would have the chance while deployed to, to meet their religious needs. They have now been, and this is official, they have been uh, for many years also designated as ethical advisors to command. Now that in and of itself may make us uncomfortable should we put uh, chaplains in that position when again they are not a homogenous group, when the ethics that they are being asked to promote is not clear. Does that mean they are to be ethical advisors based on military ethics? Uh, are they to be ethical advisors based on their own internal faith group uh, based uh, values and ethics? What is that meant to be? Uh, they brought in a bunch of philosophers to try to explain this to them. And uh, I, I can't begin to tell you how initially, uh, well, perhaps you heard enough from, from my father, but uh, how initially uh, annoyed they were at us standing up and trying to talk to them about Kant and Mill. Not because they, I mean, a lot of them already had studied Kant and Mill. These are very intelligent, well-educated uh, men and women. But they were annoyed at the suggestion that we were telling them that their job as a chaplain was to be the in-house ethicist. That didn't, didn't seem right. But then the people who effectively hired us said, that's exactly what you need to teach them. That's exactly part of their charge. So we have a mission creep aspect. We have um, a, a mission that in and it of itself may be uh, brutally unfair. And uh, then there's the, the one final thing I will raise, which was also touched on in, in my father's talk, uh, the complete um, the genuinely shameful lack of consideration for care for the caregivers, that these chaplains are experiencing vicarious trauma uh, and uh, that, it, well, and direct trauma in some cases as well, but certainly extensive vicarious trauma. And not only are, are there not systems in place uh, to, to support them to the degree that, that, that they should be supported, uh, but it often harms their career if they express concern about these issues. It's seen as a weakness, it's seen as a failure, and it harms, if they ask, for example, for some time off uh, to process some of these, these challenges that they're facing or some of this trauma. Uh, as I was being, um, uh, closing out my conversation, being sort of out-processed after speaking as the keynoter at that conference last month for the chaplains, uh, the gentleman who had, the chaplain who had invited me was uh, telling me in a, in a very, very uh, um, pained way that what people don't understand is that for all we hear, and absolutely true, what we hear about um, deployments becoming uh, more inhumane, that, that for all troops they're having less time to recover and uh, more and more deployments and the harm that this does, nobody is talking about the fact that commanders for example, are expected to keep up that pace for maybe two years, which is already too much to ask. But chaplains are asked to keep it up for 20 years. It is, in many cases, you know, that long of a commitment. And they're asked, when they're back on shore duty, to continue to serve these traumatized individuals. So the pace doesn't slacken. There is no true shore duty release time for them. And they continue to be re-traumatized and, and there's no provision currently made or, or even really much recognition of the fact that we are asking too much of them, which is a theme I fear we keep coming back to. So I'd like to field questions either about what you heard. Um, I'm not saying I agree with everything that my father said, but I was there in a lot of cases and can hopefully um, uh, express at least my views, if not his, and um, be happy to answer any questions from my own perspective as well. Yes. Do they need to come to the mic? You need to come to the mic. Yes. Um, I I was just wondering um, if 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 chap any chaplain might uh, feel. That uh, that fighting in any war whatsoever um, might be against their religion because it it, it says r right in the Bible it says resist not evil. Okay, when when, when Jesus was being led away to the cross, um, Peter took out a sword and, and cut off somebody's ear, and Jesus said. Put that sword away. I, I, I don't need that th those kind of weapons to to defend me. Mm -hmm. um, so that uh, 
it, it seems as if um, chaplains of of the Christian faith might might feel it, it at some point that that any kind of participation in in war itself is, is a violation of their faith. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. I'll I'll give a two actually examples that relate to this. One is, uh, you heard the case that my father uh, relayed about um, a chaplain who actually took up a gun and wanted to shoot uh, back against, against the enemy. And his, uh, what they call RP, his, his RP, his, uh, which is <laughs> um, specific res a designation that basically is the guy who has the gun because the chaplain doesn't have the gun and follows the chaplain around and is supposed to keep them safe. Uh, it's more to it than that, of course, but that is one of their roles. Um, the RP said, you know, I got this. You, you, this is not your job, chaplain. But interestingly, on, on the flip side of that, in a way, uh, I heard from chaplains who said that because they were pacifist in their faith tradition, now not all faith traditions and not all interpretations of Christianity are pacifist, uh, pacific, so there's a, a, lot, a wide range there too. Uh, but there were some who were um, uh, from faith traditions that are opposed to all wars. And um, one, one such uh, um, a female chaplain spoke to me at one of the PTTCs, and she said that you know she, she was okay with the fact that she was not bearing arms, and she felt that she had a role to play in, in both facilitating her, her basic core role in facilitating access uh, to, to uh, religious services, but also uh, to provide succor to, to those who were going through these very difficult and, and, and morally and, and spiritually challenging experiences. So she felt like she had a role that was positive that didn't she did not feel that it meant she was endorsing what was going on with the war. So she was able to make that distinction. But what troubled her was that this RP was assigned to her. And I, I asked her to explain that. And she said, well, the trouble is that this RP is supposed to defend me, and I don't want to be defended. Now, she wasn't addressing the larger issue of, you know, you also pay taxes to support a military that's defending you more broadly, so, you know, maybe you want to work through all of that. Uh, but um, she was acknowledging that, that in this smaller, more personal case for her, she wasn't sure how to reconcile the fact that she didn't carry a gun, but there was someone whose job it was to potentially not only kill but die for her to keep her alive. And she didn't have a choice in the military structure to say, I don't want an RP. That wasn't allowed for her. So that created another conflict, yet another uh, divided loyalty for her. And the other case uh, that, that um, uh, I would mention to you is uh, there was a chaplain who um, I met who was actually a retired chaplain who had served during the Vietnam War. And he um, took a lot of abuse when he returned home uh, from, from members of his own faith group who felt that it was completely inappropriate for him to have served with the military at that time. Now, this was a not uncommon broadly for people to be abused for participating in that in that conflict. I hope we've come a long way from blaming the troops. But um, in any case, uh, he answered um, uh, with this statement, which you can interpret as you wish. But he said, "You know, where would you rather have me be?" And basically, to to push that a little further, what he was arguing is, if there's a war going on that you think is unjust, would you rather there were no chaplains there? Would you rather there was no one there who uh, might share your concerns? Would you rather we all turned our back and left? So you know, his perspective was, uh, it is it's precisely when there might be a concern about just war that you need the people there who have that concern to potentially be another voice. So that was that was his his take on that. Yes. <laughs> Mission creep mm -hmm. question. Um, for those of us that don't understand how it works, yeah. could you explain how that happened to the chaplains, the ethical advisor status? Mm -hmm. Did the chaplains have a voice in that, or was this just something that was mm -hmm. done mm -hmm. without them uh, being part of the decision making? Mm -hmm. Uh, they actually were not part of the decision on, on that uh, originally, and they are not very comfortable with it. And it's a kind of provision that. Um, let me give you the, the timing again as it relates to our, the, the PDTCs that we did. Uh, it was the kind of provision that had kind of slipped into the background. Um, it had not been a focus point. But then uh, a, an admiral, Admiral Iacello, Lou Iacello, um, became the chief of Navy chaplains. 
and made it to some degree his personal mission, but he was also getting pressure from, from uh, other um, senior commanders, non-chaplain senior commanders, to remind the chaplain corps that this was part of their mission. I don't actually know how far back that dates, but I actually think it's it maybe to the inception of the chaplain corps that that was placed in the language that the chaplains will facilitate, uh, you know, the the uh, practice of religion and serve as an ethical uh, advisor to command. And I think for a long time that was seen as sort of a well, yeah, you know, just, just sort of thrown in there, you know, and serve as an ethical advisor to command. Yeah, you do that too. But what Iacello was saying uh, was that's a core part of your mission, and you need to take that seriously. To which a lot of his chaplains said, well, we don't know what that means. And I think they were right to ask, we don't know what that means. But the response, and I'm, I'm not knocking the admiral for this, I, I, I appreciate that he called in philosophers, but, <laughs> but he, uh, his response was to say, well, let's make this one of their professional training um, projects, is we will bring in people to help them figure out what that means. How do I serve as an ethical advisor to command? But I found it very interesting that the very next chief of chaplains turned very far away from that again and, and actually essentially reversed course and said, um, you know, don't focus on that. That's not your prime role. Your prime role is to just facilitate uh, the practice of, of, of religion within, uh, among your troops and, uh, you know, sort of back off from that ethical advisor, which is not to say that he was saying, you know, I don't want you to care about whether the military is ethical or not, but he was uncomfortable with that being uh, part of their role. So there's a, there's a real, um, you know, that my, my father's book here is called War and Moral Dissonance. There's a certain cognitive dissonance here that, you know, they're not sure uh, what they want to be and whether it's fair to ask them to be all of these things at once. Um, and uh, I, I tend to think that uh, this is the, uh, this is only a little facetious, but I, I think this is the military uh, being cheap, and they ought to hire ethicists if they want ethicists. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, it's not going to go over well. They're trying to cut funding, not uh, increase it. But, uh, and I'm not volunteering right this moment. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think that it is unfair to ask chaplains to both be true to their faith groups and, and be facilitators in the way that is already challenging. And then on top of that, ask them to be ethical advisors without giving them a clear standard of what that ethical advisement would mean. I, I think that's not a fair mandate. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. And don't worry, Dr. French will actually be back. She's going to go um, do the closing for this afternoon. We are going to take a 15 minute break, so we'll start back up again at 10 minutes past. Um, we will have then our last panel discussion, which is going to focus on the ethical and legal obligations of law enforcement, police officers, corrections officers um, in their military duties um, as well. And then we'll have the closing statements then from Dr. French. So see you in 15 minutes. <laughs>